Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are about to discuss a new topic, new topic for our class, and also it is a new topic. If we talk about uh, legal scholarship in Central Asia, in the, the last couple of years, many people have become interested in this topic. Many people are actually trying to write their candidate or PhD dissertations on this topic. And the topic itself is of utmost importance, which is to find a nexus between artificial intelligence and intellectual property rights. So there are various dimensions through which we can explore this topic. It uh, is also related to how the technological innovations have improved the technology itself, uh, the general patent system, but uh, above all, the matter of uh, philosophical importance is related to the artificial intelligence and its own autonomous creation which means that if uh, a robot or an autonomous system creates something by its own, the question related to the ownership of these intellectual property rights, it is becoming more and more important. Intellectual property itself has always been a core question for legal scholarship. It is argued that we need property rights to protect ideas and innovations. Whenever someone has an idea, someone needs some sort of incentive. His ideas need some sort of monetized incentives for the author. And to get these monetized benefits from the ideas, one needs to get registration. One needs to get the credit that he was the owner or actual author of this intellectual work. So your ideas or innovations are your property, like your tangible properties. Similarly, you can have ownership of your ideas and innovations. So ideas and innovations cannot give you the actual property rights until unless you want to have a physical manifestation of this thing. So, it is argued that the property rights should be there to protect our ideas and innovation. And after making an innovation, disseminate, disseminating it or spreading it allows more people to enjoy its advantages. So the one benefit is for the author that the author can get the due credit of his invention. On the other side, it is beneficial for the mankind that mankind can get benefits from the invention of an intellectual person. So after getting the ownership right, one need to disseminate or one need to spread. It is obvious that the person cannot spread itself or cannot market itself unless he becomes sure that he will get the due credit of his innovation. So he goes for a patent agency to get the patent of it. Without property right, the inventor would try to keep the innovation secret in order to profit for, from it. So if there is no monetized benefit for me, for me, for my invention, or if I know that my idea will not bring me any money, yes, I will try to keep it secret. If it is a product of very personal use, I will keep it to myself or my close family members and would not like to share it. But on the other side, if I get some sort of monetized benefit, then definitely I would like other people to get benefit from this product. And in the result, I can make some sort of monetized benefit from it or I can get money from it. So if there is no system to protect my ideas or my intellectual property, if I invent something, I will keep it to myself. So we have numerous examples in history, in the Rome, in the Venice, in the Renaissance period, Roman Venetians carefully guarded their glass making secrets. 
so they make very beautiful grasses and the secret to make them they kept it hidden i took this example just because last time when i visited fergana valley i visited uh, the rishtan rishtan in uzbekistan is a place where they make very beautiful handicrafts particularly related to the utensils they they do design these pots and pottery and these uh, utensils or just artifacts and they do many uh, they they do use many beautiful colors and uh, different families are guarding these secrets for themselves and uh, different families they have some sort of monopoly on their special crafts and they are not willing to share it with the others they have a tradition of ustad shagird where the disciple go to a specific family and learn this art from them but uh, they have their uniqueness they have their uh, uh, some sort of uh, individuality in their work and they don't share it with others so this is an example from uzbekistan and if we talk about uh, in literature in literature also people guarded their their secrets for example shakespeare carefully guarded the text of his play some people say that they actually wrote his poems or the writings in a codified languages which only he can understand so shakespeare also guarded his work because he was a person who actually started getting due credit of his work during his lifetime usually it happens that the scientists or especially the poets or the writers when they die after their death they get the credit of their work but shakespeare was one of those people who actually uh, started getting recognition while he was still alive and people knew that this is a talented person and intellectual of this time in terms of his literate, literary writings so he was he was very careful about uh, guarding his his Uh, writing so that the other person couldn't copy or to just avoid the simple plagiarism and uh, if we talk about um, coca cola uh, in the beginning we know that the coca cola was something uh, which was used for medicinal purposes and uh, and uh, still now till now the original recipe is being guarded by by the company and i read somewhere that when uh, in the beginning coca cola recipe was written somewhere and some people had memorized this recipe and they wouldn't travel in one aeroplane just in order to protect the recipe so it is possible that all the people who know the recipe they are flying in the same aeroplane and the plane crashes it's mean that the recipe will also crash so they would they would dry, uh, they would uh, fly in in different planes so that in case of a catastrophic incident like plane crash the recipe should be Uh, guarded and the recipe should stay there many other products nowadays we know that uh, they are very conscious about their intellectual property uh, uh, intellectual property rights and uh, they guard it very carefully not only in terms of uh, their registration with the intellectual property rights organization but the physical copies are also kept uh, or if it is software then the encryption level is very high so the patent protection has become a science and when they whenever they or in any area where there, there is a control uh, the law intervenes and uh, if you read this paper you can just simply type the name the case against patent and you can find this paper it is uh, available in open access so many people who are in favor of intellectual property and they say that the secret should be guarded there are some people who are actually against the patent and the whole concept of intellectual property rights and uh, they actually have proved it by using different examples different methodologies by using uh, different scientific uh, uh, methodologies they have actually proved that there is no benefit of uh, getting intellectual property of your innovation for example this paper argue that there is no empirical evidence the patent serves to increase innovation and productivity which means that you cannot say that if you are getting the intellectual property rights or if you get the patent of your invention uh, you will you will be more motivated to do further inventions or 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 the whole system is not actually contributing to the innovation itself it's mean that uh, the intellectual property is not correlating with the progression in innovation so unless the latter is identified with the number of patent awarded 
which as evidence show that has no correlation with major productivity. So in simple words, the number of patents is going up, but in terms of productivity, they are going down. For example, people just registered patent for the sake of patent. And in terms of productivity, there is no productivity. A closer look at the historical and international evidences suggest that while weak patent systems may mildly increase innovation with limited side effects, strong patent system have negative side effects. Uh, the, the, the thing is very, very interesting that uh, the people uh, who have uh, some sort of patent registration and these patents are re related to utility patents. And utility pat patents are uh, of mildly importance. Uh, and people tend to make utility patents because first of all, they are easy to register and they have uh, uh, some sort of immediate monetized benefit. On the other side, the people who make very sophisticated patents or very, very sophisticated uh, you know, innovations, uh, it is very difficult for them to get monetized benefit at a very, very you know, early stage. It may take many years for them to get the benefits. And similarly, in terms of execution, a very sophisticated innovation, which is patented, uh, it takes a lot of time to you know, deliver the actual benefits of that innovation to the mankind. So, yes, the patent puzzle, in spite of the enormous increase in the number of patents and the strength of their legal protection, we have seen no dramatic acceleration in the rate of technological progress that can be traced to increase patent protection and nor a major increase in the level of research and development expenditures and greater use of patents in major in mature established and established industries where major players seek to lock in rents so the point which he is trying to make is in this paper that if there are more patents we should have more benefits benefits to the mankind. But we are just observing the increase in the patents and contrary to this, not much crude benefit. Not many countries are interested to invest in research and development regardless of the increased number of patents. Uh, scientists do register so many patents, but in return, they don't get any funding. So this is something which he's trying to prove. Another question, uh, another paper, uh, op-ed, you can say, published in The Economist, a question of utility. Most of the wonders of the modern age, from mule spinning to railways, steamships to gas lamps, seems to have emerged without the help of patents. So the very interesting point he has made, that all the innovations, the benefits of them we are reaping today, they were not patented means the people did inventions, the innovations were not registered anywhere and people are getting benefits from them. Since the beginning of the industrial revolution, many industrial equipments, they were just built for the sake of humanity so that the mankind would get benefit out of them. And no one actually thought about making money out of this. This is a comparatively new phenomena that if a scientist makes something new, he wants to get benefit in the monetized terms based on his invention, but it was not the core philosophy in the beginning. If the industrial revolution didn't need them, why have them at all? So the question is that in the beginning of industrial revolution, when we had a paradigm, system, a paradigm shift in our whole production system, at that time we had no patent system. If that time, we had no patent system, why we need it now? And the benefits of industrial revolution, no can, nobody can deny them. So you can see these innovations uh, and all of these innovations, just close your eyes and think about uh, 18th century and 19th century. Most of the things which are there, they, they were not patented by anyone and uh, and mankind is, is using it. A good example of this is Microsoft's, Microsoft's uh, Windows. Uh, 
sometimes you you might have thought that microsoft is actually very generous in terms of sharing his windows um, i am sure that most of you guys have not bought this window all of us we have pirate copies of this windows so very less people are actually interested in spending money on on this uh, you know microsoft window uh, and if i am not mistaken only 30% of the users have have spent some sort of money uh, to get the licensed version of this microsoft window and majority of us we are not paying anything to microsoft and still the bill gates is one of the richest persons so you can just imagine that his invention is benefiting the mankind and mankind is not paying a single penny and still this person is one of the richest person so the point is that his invention is of uh, utmost importance for mankind and somehow the nature is awarding him i would say it in more philosophical terms but on the other side the point is that he doesn't care that people should get a registered version because there are substantial uh, substitutional products which come come with the microsoft windows which one user has to buy in order to get the benefit of microsoft windows software for example you need a laptop <laughs> for running a window and without the window uh, without the window laptop is a, is something useless and similarly the window is useless without the laptop and through this system they are benefiting the hardware and software industries correlating and they are benefiting each other so this guy a uh, very interesting quote martin thought buying an affordable prescription drug and jacking up the price by more than 50 fold overnight was a billion dollar idea 1 billion here we come he wrote to the board chairman of his drug company turning pharmaceuticals before the transaction in terms of covid 19 uh, analogous example that in the beginning lot many papers were written and many people were very outspoken about the consequentialism uh, that uh, in the future vaccine will be very expensive and people will not be able to afford it but at present at present i think that the things are contrary people are more gen generous towards and even the vaccine pharmaceutical companies are more generous towards the cause which is to help the mankind governments are giving free doses free jabs of uh, over 19 vaccine not only the single one but 2 2 3 3 4 4 uh, doses one person can get just free of cost and it it also favors this idea that pharmaceutical industry in our subconscious mind was considered as a devil but uh, uh, happened to be very generous when there was a threat to the mankind in terms of covid 19 so granting of patents excites fraud stimulate men to run after schemes that may enable them to levy a tax on the public begets disputes and calls betwist inventors provokes endless lawsuits and bestows rewards on the wrong persons uh, in simple word in our observation as well when you have to register a patent you can just go on google patent or there are many softwares available you can go and you can type the invention and when you will see this invention you will see there are not thousand but hundreds or maybe tens of patents are available which are similar in nature so what happens it demonstrate that the people have already thought about the similar things and they have actually got the patent so the analogous product the inventor will think about some sort of loopholes or bypass the system or to do a minor modification in the original design just to make sure that this product does not look like the existing registered product so that he can also get a patent and can get a reward or or some sort of incentive so the granting of patent excites frauds there is no uh, bias in it it is actually happening people do try to bypass the system people do try to find loopholes in the existing patent applications or the patent registration process of the similar analogous product just to get their own product register and just to demonstrate that their product has some sort of uniqueness or individuality time to fix patents 
how we can fix patents use it or lose it rule so the one suggestion is that if a patent has no utility and this is just a registration of uh, some sort of an idea in a physical manifested form uh, and and there is no use of it or you are not using it or you are unable to demonstrate the pragmatic importance of your idea then you will lose the patent we cannot give you a right to register it forever okay so if there is no utility you have to lose your patent right which means you have to lose your property right make it easier to challenge patent the other thing is that we should make a system which allows other invent inventors or the scientists to challenge the existing registered patents or even the application process is too complicated sometimes it it has been observed in my personal practice also sometimes it becomes very complicated that a very innovative idea takes no <laughs> sorry to say hundreds but but couple of years to get it registered with the patent authority and many people uh, down the road just uh, lose the motivation to get it registered so this is about the registration process but you can imagine how complicated it would be to challenge an existing patent which is more complicated yes so the more complicated process also decrease the flux of new invention or demotivate the people who are uh, with a, a unique idea and interesting idea in comparison to already registered idea so it is better for us to make a system which allow us to challenge the existing patents so that the people people could come up with new idea with more beneficial ideas which have pragmatic importance some sort of for the mankind make no obvious standard harder uh in the patent application there is a rule that your your invention should be not obvious which means that everyone shouldn't know about it you cannot get a patent of of uh, for example a bag you cannot say that i have invented bag to help the uh, carry the things it is obvious that bag is used for the ca carrying of the things yes so make non obvious standard harder means you have to think about uh, you have to think about uh, the products which uh, which are not obvious and the scrutiny of non of or uh, non obvious should be should be you know improved and shorter time periods means that you cannot give the patent for the lifetime you should give it for a shorter period of time so that the other person can bring new modifications or can get the benefit of the product at a much cheaper cost for example insulin insulin in the beginning was very expensive and the diabetic patients some of them wouldn't buy the insulin just because they couldn't afford of its high price but when the patent expired now it is available everywhere everywhere in a much cheaper price and new innovations have been done by the pharmaceutical industry or people who are affiliated with biotechnology and genetic engineering and the scientists as a uh, uh, affiliated with the medical industries they have done new innovations uh, in the insulin not only in the in the medicine itself but uh, different route of administration of insulin is being uh, are being uh, uh, you know detected uh, for example uh, now it is available not only in injection but uh, uh, maybe in tablet or or some other routes have been discovered um, and the instruments are available which cause less pain when you instrument when you uh, administer this uh, this uh, insulin so when we give uh, when we give patent the suggestion is that we should give it for the shorter period of time because many people wouldn't do uh, any modification or any improvement in a design just because it is patented by someone else yes why would i sp i spend my time stamina energy or even resources to to improve something which is patented by someone else and someone else will get benefit of it so these are some suggestions and uh, what are the other alternates you think the best solution is to abolish patent entirely through strong strong constitutional measures and to find other legislative instruments less open to lobbying and rent seeking to foster innovation whenever there is a clear evidence that lesser fare under supplies it 
So I partially agree with this statement that uh, many innovations are there just for the sake of rent seeking. And the innovation is not happening in that specific product just because the scientists think that he will not get any monetized benefit out of bringing new modifications or improvement into an existing product which is patented by someone else. So these people and uh, uh, NASA and uh, other other big organizations now they have they have uh, figured out a system of giving awards or prizes. Okay. Yes, you can you can give a prize for an innovation which is demanded. It is like a grant system in academia. When a company needs some sort of proposal from academicians, they propose a grant, a call for grant. Similarly, there is a possibility to do the call for patent. When we think that there is a need of a specific product, we can just call for innovation. We can just simply say that, okay, now we need this utility product. The scientist who will make this product, we will give them this amount of money. I think this is a much better incentive for a scientist to get a lump sum amount of money rather than to get a patent and no money at all. Let's watch this video. I'm going to show you some magic. The real thing. <laughs> I genuinely love the process of manipulating people online for money. President Trump is a total and complete dip. Ford, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. If humans are already tricked by, you know, simple spam emails, uh, I think deep fakes are going to be really effective in the future if there are tools in place against them. There's a project called the Video Replay Program, and that was the first major application of a deep fake. And you take one person talking in a video track and sync it to a different audio track, and you know manipulate their face to make it seem like they're um, talking from the other audio track. I never met for a start. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. The term deepfake comes from deep learning mixed with fake events. So the fake event is the you know output of what a deepfake comes up with. And then um, deep learning is the, the process to come up with the algorithms and everything to um, you know combine the image with the video. The deepfake relies on a neural network, which basically takes a large sample of data and finds patterns throughout them. So you can take an image and apply it to a video of somebody moving their face. What's up, TikTok? Every now and then I like to treat myself. You know, deep bunkers, if, if that was used for malicious, malicious purposes, um, you know, you could use a platform like TikTok to go viral and spread, you know, pretty dangerous news. <laughs> As a human, if we pull up a video of someone and if the, if the voices sound similar enough, I feel like the image of the, um, you know, the deep fake will, will kind of trick the ears into like, you know, being like, oh, hey, that's that person's voice. Um, and, you know, there are pretty good voice actors who can, who can rep almost replicate the real thing. apply it to a still image but what they have to do is they first have to use algorithms to take that image at a low quality resolution and turn it into a high quality resolution it's bringing deep fakes to the masses in a way that hasn't really been seen before 
I think by being able to take like, for example, like an old deceased family member, um, taking one of their pictures and kind of, you know, turning them back into life, that, that could be a really cool experience for a lot of people. Making a world leader and um, making a deep think out of them, and basically they could, you know, say whatever they want. They could um, say things to cause public unrest. Um, you know, say like, I guess, um, give dangerous information or dangerous, I guess, like commands. Um, you know, to people. You know, family members can be impersonated, so scams can happen that way as well. And I'd say like ten years ago, when text was the biggest thing, text and images. Um, it wasn't nearly as big of an issue, but now, um, you know, I, I already feel like the shorter form video platforms already have a huge like misinformation issue um, and fake news issue um, because video is so convincing. I'm sure like hackers are going to get much more creative about this stuff, especially going forward. <laughs> I think big tech is going to be banding together and focusing on tools that can help prevent um, deep fakes or at least catch them right away and probably like uh, provide labels uh, say hey this like you know isn't good especially you know on Facebook Instagram um, TikTok any of these um, apps these social media companies are, are the ones that need to be focusing on creating these tools I think at the forefront of all of this um, because they're the ones who be most heavily impacted and their users as well. So this was just an example to show that how much the challenging situation is for intellectual property itself, just because of the uh, innovation in the area of artificial intelligence. The Tom Cruise in this video is not Tom Cruise. Kim Kardashian is not Kim Kardashian. Barack Obama is not Barack Obama. And at the end, you saw that certain people has, has been shown the pictures of their loved ones in uh, uh, in a motion form and they become very emotional so there are so many layers not only the legal layer but uh, psychological or even the philosophical layer is there which need to peel off just to understand the manifestation or the consequences of this talk type of new innovation technology and definitely definitely it is it is a challenge it is a challenge for the intellectual property regime as a whole so in the era of fourth generation of human rights, which is the generation of robot right. Uh, we also have the fourth industrial revolution. You can say that there are challenges for the human rights in the era of fourth industrial revolution, or you can say that fourth industrial revolution is a challenge for the fourth generation of human rights or vice versa. No doubt the artificial intelligence is revolutionary technology not revolutionizing our lives directly, but indirectly, we cannot say that we can escape from the benefits or the negative consequences of artificial intelligence. Uh, it has already surrounded us. Uh, so moving on, just a background for the educational purposes, what is the industrial revolution, industrial revolution, we all know, I don't, I don't need to explain it further. Uh, in the early 1700s, we have faced so many changes, not only the economical changes, but the political changes also. We know that the French Revolution happened and the French Revolution was a kind of revolution, not only in France, but revolutionized the whole thought process of mankind. People started talking about uh, liberty, democracy, human rights, equality, and these sort of things. So-called so, so called, uh, uh, the liberal regime flourished in, in this century. And uh, if we talk about innovations, then the steam engine, water, mechanical production equipments uh, um, were improved. This is the first industrial revolution. And the second industrial revolution, division of labor, electricity, and mass production happened. It is the time when, when very interesting period in the history of mankind, when the uh, when the Europe 
divided into two big powers, the French and the British, they are colonizing the world. So th this is the time when they have abundance of labor and resources just, be just because they are occupying different lands in Asia and Africa and using those uh, uh, financial resources, intellectual resources, or just the manual labor which they were, they were uh, uh, importing from there for doing the mass production in their own countries. And then in the 20th century, this is the century of electronics, IT, and automated production. Things have become more simpler in terms of your, their utility, but more complex, scientifically speaking. And a lot many innovations were there with regards to the electronics, IT systems, and automated production. Just for the sake of information, the first automated uh, accountant, I mean, I mean, ATM machine, ATM machine was invented in 1964 or in 60s you can say and uh, this was the this is the this is the greatest example if we say that automation of accounting system um, and and the, and the and the need for having a accountant or the intelligent accountant at that time they realized that now our jobs are in threat <laughs> so fourth industrial revolution in 21st century now we have uh, stepped into the fourth industrial revolution Many people are saying that by the 50s, I mean 2050s, we will already have a fifth industrial revolution, the revolution of quantum computing with the emergence of 6G, there will be an other boom, yes? So the cyber physical system, uh, recently we know that the Facebook has been rebranded to Meta and Meta is uh, a completely different experience for the mankind where physical system are interacting with the with our virtual systems, uh, you can just imagine while sitting here, I, I will be able to see you and you will be able to see me delivering a lecture in full-fledged physical form while we are not present in the same auditorium. Yes. So if, we, if you go on YouTube, you can find numerous videos of uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg explaining uh, different dimensions of meta, how it, it is going to revolutionize the lives of individuals. On the other hand, uh, how it is going to benefit uh, the economic system. Of course, uh, the user-friendly experience is very much uh, in demand. People want to touch the things or at least to see the things in their actual physical manifestation before paying the money. So this meta, or these cyberspace uh, virtual realities or the combination of virtual reality and augmented reality is definitely going to bring, you know, uh, a revolution in our, our thought process as well as in the business industry. So, but on the other side, sometimes I think that this all virtual reality or augmented reality experience goes against everything known as important for good mental health and meaningful life. The human connection attachment, we are attached to each other through our physical bodies and enjoyment of pleasure of full body embodiment. I mean, when you shake hand with your friends, this is a truly entirely different experience rather than to say hello on the telephone and mindful awareness in the present moment in the real world. When something is in front of my eyes and I know that this is physically present, this is entirely a different experience rather than to think about a cyberspace where I can apparently see with my own eyes, but on the other side, in my subconscious mind, I know that this is not the physical manifest. This is just a just a virtual manifestation of something physical. So as, as a doctor as well, I have a medical degree. As a doctor as well, I think that this really frightens me and uh, especially for the mentally vulnerable people and children. In our previous videos, which I showed you this about defects, you can see that the people were very much emotional about, about their loved ones. When the pictures of their dead loved ones were shown to them, moving uh, or the motion pictures were shown to them, they became so much emotional. Similarly, you can see that the virtual reality in the fourth industrial revolution 
or the augmented reality or mixed reality is is bringing not only the challenges for the political scientists legal scientists economists but also for the for the uh, psychologists or the people who are working in the area of mental health or the physical health the fourth industrial revolution the advent of cyber physical system involving entirely new capabilities for people and machines as we talked earlier the marriage of physical and advanced digital technologies such as analytics artificial intelligence cloud computing and the internet of things so these are two definitions for the sake of definition if someone asked you that what is the fourth industrial revolution you can simply say that it is the marriage of physical and advanced digital technologies uh, which we are experience right now and uh, uh, <clears throat> in the first class if you remember i gave you the definition of artificial intelligence yes and uh, and uh, since then i have been receiving uh, uh, so many interesting definitions by my students and by your interaction which you do with me or the different messengers or or social media and we have been discussing the artificial intelligence but these are some of the some of the contemporary understandings about artificial intelligence i just uh, i am just going to revise some of the stuff from the first lecture just to recall and to see that where we are standing today so a machines adaptation of cognitive functions that are associated with human mind such as understanding of language problem solving and learning this is a scientific definition if someone asks you that what is artificial intelligence and i told you in the first class that there is no definition of artificial intelligence yes because artificial intelligence is very subjective topic for every person the definition of artificial intelligence is the definition which he thinks is suitable for him okay but uh, from a third person perspective or for the sake of writing is somewhere or if someone asks you what is artificial intelligence you can say that the machines adaptation of a cognitive function cognitive function is the brain function or psychological function or the thinking process that are associated with human minds so you can say that the machine if he starts thinking like a human mind for example machine start understanding languages machine start solving problems and machine start learning something new like a human brain you can say that it is artificial intelligence now the two days topic in the sense of patent law mathematical algorithms allowing computer to simulate intelligent human behavior and we have discussed in detail about algorithms and the ethics of algorithms if uh, you remember from the fourth and fifth class we have discussed this the artificial intelligence ethics and european patent office defined that in the sense of patent law for the purpose of defining mathematical algorithms allowing computer to simulate intelligent human behavior it is called as artificial intelligence so if you go and you want to get your patent for your autonomous system first scrutiny is to look at the definition that your invention correlates with the with the definition provided by european patent office which means that the mathematical algorithms are they simulate the intelligent human behavior or not and i told you earlier that if you have a idea and this idea is new idea you cannot get patent of your idea until unless you put this idea on to the paper you cannot go to the patent office and say that oh i have an idea and i want to get my idea patented no you have to put this idea on the paper you have to put this idea into the specific format and you have to fulfill the criteria of the patent which i will describe later and then only you can get your invention patented okay so artificial narrow intelligence in the first class we looked at it but here is uh, you know the empirical definition you can say that specialized in a specific area for example you have a computer and this computer is specialized in a specific area you can say that it is equipped with artificial intelligence for example your car is autonomous car it is driverless car car 
you can say that my car is equipped with artificial intelligence and this is a narrow artificial intelligence narrow artificial intelligence means it can do only one work so uh, similarly if you have a mobile translator and this is embedded with artificial intelligence but it can do only translation it's mean that it is narrow narrow artificial intelligence what are the benefits it can solve complex problems extremely fast but have no perception of things other than the information provided to them by the creators for example google translator becoming more and more sophisticated but the google translator has the information which is fed to him by its creators whenever google introduce a new language it hires translator and the volunteers who actually feed information into it so that the system become more and more sophisticated for example in the case of uzbek language now the google translator can can do the translation from english to uzbek but when the project was started i am sure that they might have hired people from uzbekistan some of them they were paid and some of them they actually contributed voluntarily to make this system more and more sophisticated okay so uh, similarly uh, apple's siri uh, you can uh, talk to talk to this this software it can uh, open the windows function onto your computer if you say hey siri and then you ask the question and it it process the information and bring answers to you or different video games or search engines they are sophisticated and they are embedded with artificial intelligence but as a whole they are artificial narrow intelligence and what is artificial general intelligence artificial general intelligence we discussed uh, earlier that artificial general intelligence is the intelligence at the level of human brain if you remember the graph i showed you in the different classes that by the year 2010 we had a computer which was a quad 2 core or the core i7 and it was as intelligent as the brain of a mouse yes and now today we have core i9 in in some of our computers which we are using and it is expected that in near future we will have a computing system which will be as intelligent as the brain of a human so by the time when we will have this artificial general intelligence uh, and 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 actually today we have some systems which are performing much better than the humans and we have seen we actually tried to define these systems in earlier classes so artificial narrow intelligence is the computer system which performs something much better than a human but artificial general intelligence means this computer can perform anything what a human can do and what is artificial super intelligence artificial super intelligent is a computer which is much better than the human brain so here i have given you three definition just remember artificial intelligence artificial narrow intelligence artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence artificial narrow intelligence which does a specific thing artificial general intelligence which is as intelligent as the brain of a human and artificial super intelligence which can perform functions much better than a human brain so it is just for the sake of definition and for your own memorization so what is artificial intelligence there is no single definition and the narrow artificial intelligence already i have described that it addresses specific applications i mean artificial intelligence can do only one thing and uh, the autonomous driving vehicle is a good example of a narrow artificial intelligence a translator into your mobile phone is a good example of the narrow artificial intelligence and similarly if we look at the artificial intelligence explosion uh, and uh, this is this is this is the academic academic part yes it, it is about the publications that what sort of publications are emerging in uh, in the leading scientific journals so if you look at the graph it shows that uh, 
the, the, the publications related to computer science are going up and the, and the publications related to artificial intelligence are leading and all other sciences, they are much less than the computer science and artificial intelligence. All sciences means everything in humanities and social sciences, you can say physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. All of these publications are much less as compared to the publications in computer science, which are also much, much less as compared to the publications in artificial intelligence, which shows, what does it show? It shows that the scientific community is much more focused and concentrated on writing and publishing related to artificial intelligence. Some technical foundation of artificial intelligence, tools that can process vast amount of data, detect and interpret patterns. We already know about this. Uh, it was practically impossible for us to do much of the things related to mathematics or computing by using our manual intellect. Just think about multiplying a 10 figure number with the 10, fi 10 figure number uh, on a paper. Just, just imagine if you want to multiply 20,000 something, something with 20,000 something, something, it is a very complicated process for a human brain. But for a, a computer, it is just a click away. And, uh, they have enabled machine production, diagnosis, modeling, and risk analysis much easier, yes. AI as an essential element enabling effective use of large data volumes, not manageable manually. You cannot write papers and papers or papers related data. You can simply feed them into the computer and then the artificial intelligence can simply calculate it for you. And machine learning, a method of data analysis that automates analytical modeling building. Uh, we have already seen, yes, the artificial intelligence is a bigger understanding. Artificial intelligence is based on machine learning. Machine learning is related to deep learning and deep learnings are related to artificial neural networks. Yes, we have seen this already. Okay, this is an interesting graph. And uh, I want you to just take a step back and look at this graph and think about it for a while. So artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. What does it mean by general purpose technology? General purpose technology means artificial intelligence can be used for anything. Yes. You can install artificial intelligence in anything. All technologies are not general purpose technology. Artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. Yes. So steam engine, electricity, computer, semiconductor, internet, they are not general purpose technologies. You cannot use electricity for everything. You cannot use steam engine for everything. Yes. Uh, but in terms of artificial intelligence, with the use of all of these previous technologies, which were also considered as general purpose technologies at that time, I would say, now you have artificial intelligence, which is a general purpose technology. You can use it for anything. And this is uh, even better understanding. Now look, look at this, look at this graph, and then I will show you the next graph. When there was steam engine, uh, it was considered that it is a general purpose technology. You can use steam engine for anything. Similarly, electricity was everywhere. In anything, there is electricity. It was considered as general purpose technology. Means you can use electricity for everything. Computer can be used for everything. Semiconductor were used for everything. And internet can be installed in anything. This was, this was the understanding for that period that it is a general purpose technology. But today we are living in the era of artificial intelligence, which is a general purpose technology for this era. And, uh, and it is interesting to see that artificial intelligence can be installed in anything. As that's why it is a general purpose technology for this era. 
And now there is a comparison between artificial intelligence and some of the other technologies of this era, which are called as new innovation technologies. So there is artificial intelligence, there is blockchain and cryptocurrency, there are intelligent and connected devices, yes? Internet of thing, we call them internet of thing. Quantum computing, then there is clean and sustainable energy, people are talking about it. And then there is augmented reality or virtual reality. So artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. It is per uh, pervasive, it, it can improve over time, yes. It is spawn innovation, it is fundamentally disruptive. In comparison to this, if we talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency, it is difficult uh, that uh, you will bring some sort of technological innovations in the area of blockchain or cryptocurrency. They are there, you know, they are there. And, uh, and I don't know if there will be improvement in, in it or not, yes. And if we talk about uh, uh, pervasive, pervasive means spreading widely throughout an area or group of people. Artificial intelligence is spreading among all the group of people. But if we talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency, you know, it is not spreading in among all the people. Similarly, if you see the quantum computing, it is related to only those people who are into this area of quantum computing. Yes, we don't have any benefit of quantum computing. You know, theoretically speaking, I personally don't need a quantum computer. Yes, my job is being done by the laptop, which is embedded by not, not a quantum system, but a binary system. And this is more than enough for me. Yes. Similarly, if we talk about augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, here I have a little bit of doubt that that it is pervasive or not. With the emergence of meta or similar system, it is possible that it will become pervasive means that everyone will be able to reap the benefits of augmented reality and virtual reality. Previously, we discussed it extensively, yes. And if we talk about uh, technology improving with the time, all the technologies are improving with the time. And if we talk about uh, disruption, disruption means uh, does it bring uh, some sort of uh, changes into our existing thought process or uh, uh, you can say that the usage of things, yes. Um, is it disrupting or not, causing any, any kind of disruption or not, yes. Or you can say that is it a groundbreaking technology or not. Artificial intelligence is definitely groundbreaking. Blockchain is definitely groundbreaking, which means that uh, now there are so many benefits have been discovered of blockchain or uh, the cryptocurrencies and artificial intelligence in comparison to some of the other technologies which are labeled here. This is an area in which the artificial intelligence has taken over the work of humans. Uh, this is the detection of cancerous cells. When we talk about the cancer cells or skin conditions, uh, artificial intelligence is much more sophisticated in detecting some of these cancer cell or skin condition in comparison to a human doctor. So the processing of data and detection of diseases by the artificial intelligence in terms of detection of uh, skin related diseases or cancers, we can say that the artificial intelligence has already outclassed the human doctors. Now coming towards the intellectual property and, uh, and before intellectual property, let me see the time. If we have some time, then we will discuss. Otherwise we'll do it in the next class. Okay, I think it is more than one hour and I have been speaking a lot. I will conclude it here and the next time we will start from the intellectual property.